Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guest is Remzi Bayrami, a self-described anarchist Albanian born in 1973 in Yugoslavia, what is now North Macedonia, in a Muslim village near the border of Albania. He moved to Connecticut in good old USA in 1979. After working in marketing, software, real estate development, finance, and specifically in the financial markets, trading and such, these days he's the co-founder of Common Planet, a new game of life. You can learn more about Common Planet at common-planet.org. Welcome, Ramsey. Thanks for having me, Jim. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. I always love talking about people thinking about these things. Today, we're going to talk about Remzi's book, also called Common Planet. And uh, this is interesting. This is the first book that I've read, maybe the first book that's uh, hit print, that talks quite specifically about game A and game B. So uh, maybe we'll start off by, I'm kind of a little curious, how did you find the game B community? And then uh, perhaps give our audience, not all of whom are up on game B lore, uh, what those terms mean to you? Sure. Uh, it's a good place to start. The uh, I think the first time I heard the Game B terminology was probably on YouTube with uh, one of the Weinstein brothers talking with some other members. So I think I learned about the Game B Facebook community through Twitter. Actually, somebody made a Twitter, Gwendolyn Holt, I think it was, who made some kind of a tweet about, you know, saying, hey, it's time we get some, you know, action and get everyone together or something along those lines. And she created this coffee channel and those conversations ended up leading to somebody forming Game B. And I think, I feel like I was, I kind of helped to promote a lot of people over to the the channel early on, but essentially Game B, as you know, is the terminology that we're using to describe an alternative to the existing economic game, which we're now realizing is the same as what we've had forever, which was what we call Game A. Yeah, that's a good place to start. And uh, as the time goes on, it'll probably become a little bit more clear to people. By the way, if people want to learn more about Game B, probably the best way to do it is look at the short film that we recently put out called GameBFilm.org. And then if you're also interested in finding other people interested in the, the Game B movement, uh, Game-B.org. Better put a www in front of that or it might not work. So if you like what you hear here, uh, come check us out. So uh, early in the book, might have been the first page, there's a, a quote from one of my heroes, Hunter Thompson, right? Oh, yeah. And so you, you know, my sense is this is what you're pointing at. Create a place for people to live like human beings instead of slaves to some bullshit concept of progress that is driving us all mad. Yeah, he's in, basically referring to game A, you know, this equation of, of economics that, that is captured all of us, and we're trying to escape that. We're trying to escape, obviously, to a, uh, a new system. Yeah. Now, in, as you start to set out your model, and I like this book, by the way. I tell people, that, as I was telling Ramsey in the pregame, when you read self-published books, you know, unfortunately, about 90% of them kind of suck. But this one is actually good. It's well-researched, well-written, actually, and there's some things about it I'll complain about. But of course, as regular listeners know, I complain about everything. But overall, I would say it was a book that was enjoyable to read. It was clearly written. And it, it talks about some real important ideas. So I would certainly encourage those who find this conversation at all stimulating to either buy it on Amazon or you can download it for, for free in PDF format over at common-planet.org. So anyway, let's get into the structure of your argument. And you start off by early on. I don't necessarily follow the books chronologically. I took, I, I took 306 notes I, I discovered when I was processing my notes this morning, turning them into my topic sheet. Uh, so I took a lot of notes, and then I don't necessarily pull them all in in order. But anyway, one of the important distinctions you make is that in game A, there are essentially three class of players. We're talking about games, might as well have players. You have people, 
corporations, and nations. Why don't you talk just a little bit about what you mean by those three things? It's sort of obvious, but you know, put your gloss on it. Oh, sure. Well, obviously, people are the primary and only real players. But uh, the game itself, the game A, as I describe it, is to own property uh, for its value. And so who can own property? Well, people, corporations, and nations. Those other two entities are clearly fictional. But the game being, you know, to own things, somebody has to own things. And so people found that it's more advantageous to own things in larger groups than as an individual for multiple reasons. And so that's why I broke it down into those three categories. I mean, that's really what I see. Now, that was my first point of pushback is that you strongly emphasize property. And you quote Adam Smith, the division and safeguarding of property occupies the whole world. And I would say that was sort of true back in the mercantilist period, say before 1700, and in the early capitalist days before the Industrial Revolution really got rolling. But I'm going to suggest that while property at some level is important, the real engine of game A today is profit, which is different, right? You know, for instance, uh, you know, a company like uh, WhatsApp had 19 employees and, you know, a few laptops and a little this, a little that, not much, sold the damn thing for $19 million, right, when it got acquired by Facebook. And it was considered a grand success, despite the fact they didn't really accumulate any property. Rather, they created an engine that people at least thought would be profitable someday or otherwise fit into the Zuckerbergian master plan to take over the universe, and they got bought off. And I would also say, having worked in major corporations, we actually try hard not to accumulate too much property because one of the financial metrics that Wall Street looks at something called ROMA, return on managed assets. Mm -hmm. And so to the degree you can get your assets down and keep your profit up on a ROMA basis, which is a very important metric, supports your stock price, things look good. So I'm going to suggest that Overfixation on property may not quite be right. Perhaps, but you have to understand uh, the way I defined it in the book is that it is isn't just a physical thing. It's also something you know metaphysical, something that we can believe in. It, it doesn't have to be real. And so that quote, by the way, I think it was from Tolstoy, not Smith. Nevertheless. So from my view, though, remember, my definition of game A is to own property for its value. And so when you mention asset, an asset, as far as I'm concerned, regardless if it's fictional, if it's a fiction, it's a fictional piece, it's a fictional property. So it is property from in that form, in that definition, that is. Okay. So that's what I mean. So, yeah, I, I can understand the, the pushback because that word, obviously, many people may be thinking of physical property as a or real estate. Or it feels more static than it does dynamic. Sure. When, you, yeah, when you're building exactly. a company, you're trying you're trying to build an engine to create profit, right? And it's the engine, it's the output of the engine, not the engine itself that actually turns out the matter in, in business. But, just, but let's move on. It's just an interesting little point. I'd also say that obviously you and I and our compatriots aren't the first people to think about this by any means. And you know, one that I think is quite interesting is the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. A lot of the Declaration, a lot of the work of the founders was based on the work of John Locke, and Locke said that the purpose of political life is life, liberty, and property. Mm -hmm. Jefferson rejected that, actually, and wrote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which, well, of course, they actually built a, a uh, commercialist, early capitalist operating system for America. They were at least realizing that there's more to life than just property. There is, but there is no life without property. That's true, too. That's true, too. And so in a box, you call out that in game A, all value comes from trading, to extract value by trading property. And this is what I'd like to get into a little bit, because I would say another area that I that you, I wouldn't say we disagree, but there was, a little, from my perspective, under emphasis on, we'll get to more into it more later, is, again, when you actually, when people actually build a business, even if it's just a one-person business, they're focused on value added and transformation, in, unless they're a complete parasite middleman, which sometimes they are, you know, more so than just trading. Well, from the market's perspective, the entrepreneur, what they're doing is they're purchasing, they're using capital that they got, which is property, right? and they're exchanging their property through trade to buy other property. And they're buying resources, whatever they may need. They may be renting a building, they may be buying supplies, computers, et cetera. 
all these things are property. They're using their property to exchange. That's a trade. So there's trading involved there. And then they're, they're trading their money for these things. They're also trading their money for other labor if they have employees and combining those together and they produce some service or commodity and they're selling the resulting service or commodity for what you were referring to as profit. And that's, that's game A in a nutshell right there. Bam. And so all of it is trade. Every single transaction between the, the individuals is some form of property, whether physical you know, or virtual or no, I, I would buy that. Uh, but let me give you the simple example that I use when I was thinking about this. You know, a guy who builds houses for resale, as you say, he uses credit or his cash, often credit if he's done this before, buys a pile of lumber, buys some pipes, buys some wire, hires some people, does some of the work himself. Usually small home builders do 25% of the work themselves, something like that. Now, here's the interesting part, and this is the part that I th- think is sort of missing, is that this pile of lumber, pipes, wire, nails, etc., is only worth a bit as raw material. But if someone knows what they're doing, they can convert this into a house, right? They can turn in this thing into, they can add value, essentially double the value or more than double the value from the spare parts by adding labor intelligently. And that know-how, the you know, the care that goes into it. And a person can build a house in a shitty fashion or they can build a house in a great fashion using exactly the same materials. And that's really an important aspect of creation in our world, care, skill, expertise, and those kind of things. And I'm always, I'm always looking at proposed new systems to make sure they haven't forgotten about that part. Yep. Well, I come from that world. So there's no doubt that I understand what it takes to what I, I know what real labor is. I, yes, I've worked obviously with capital and finance as well, which has nothing to do with physical labor too. So I know both worlds. I get, understand that very well. But the truth is though, Jim, when we were building these homes, we didn't build them to build homes. I wasn't doing any of this for besides the purpose of profit, period. We had capital. We had the ability to buy land. We had the ability to get credit, to build a house. We n- knew all the people in construction. We did some of the construction ourselves, as you mentioned. And so, But all of it was for the purposes of profit. So we're chasing the value through these exchange, through trade. So we're trading all of these various properties that we own to capture more value for ourselves. And in the and the value form itself in this particular game is interesting too. The money, the currency system that we use is, is the way I see it is also property because what, what we're doing here is we're, we're trading, right? And so it's barter, but it, you're exchanging one property for a another property, but instead of the problems of barter, of having to you know, exchange something that the other person may not want, the double coincidence of wants, what have you, the money, the money in that value form of money, that, that kind of property solves that problem. Everybody will be willing to trade whatever property they may have for your property, which represents all other value and property. Yeah, and that's a very important point. In fact, we talked in the Game B world about generator functions. What are some of the deep underlying causes of Game A? And one of the ones I personally call out a lot is what I call the utter dominance of everything by short-term money-on-money return. By short-term, I mean about three years, something like that. And people claim they're operating the long-term bullshit, right? If they can't see it in three years, they're not doing it. That's not quite true in every case, but damn close. certainly true for home builders, right? Well, no doubt. You know, the, one of the generator functions that I see is the, you know, the inner loop of money on money return, particularly in essentially short term, up to three years kind of basis as a force field that pervasive, pervasively molds game A. And I was very happy to see that you realized that. Now, of course, I think I'm a fellow monetary nerd. As it turned out, my road into game B was four years of research on money and monetary systems and alternative monetary systems. And we'd read many of the same books, though I was doing this work 2008 to 2012. So you surfaced a bunch of books I hadn't read, so I'm not going to go back and read. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, this is a seductive topic, and it's a very important one. And we'll talk about that more as we move along. So we have a game A. It has various attributes. The fact that money on money return is the most powerful single force field results in some things which aren't so good. Now, game A, at least in my formulation, got underway in its modern form somewhere around 1700 with the invention of fractional reserve banking in the Bank of England, the invention of modern science, self-governance with the glorious revolution in England in 1688, 
the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1700s, etc., and picked up steam. And actually, it was a good thing for humanity, certainly compared to feudalism and you know divine right of kings, which came before. And it spun up remarkably quickly. This combination of capacities caused an unprecedented explosion in population, capacity to build things, etc. You know, people don't realize how small humanity was in 1700, the population of the world is about 650 million people, less than a tenth of what it is today. The average human used less than a tenth as much energy per capita as we do, and most of that was in the form of animals, draft animals. Some bit was human power, some bit was wind power, but most of it was animals, right? And we had not yet really tamed coal in any major way at 1700, and now we're consuming at least 10 times as much power per capita, and there's 10 times as many of us, so we're basically consuming 100 times as much energy as humanity did in 1700, and the vast, vast, vast preponderance of that comes from fossil fuels. And so this way of bootstrapping from dire poverty in 1700 seemed like a great idea at the time, right? But as we spun up, it had many unforeseen consequences, and then perhaps most importantly, at least in my perspective, is starting around 1945, the technologies that built one upon the other started reaching the scale where we could destroy ourselves, you know, famously nuclear weapons. You know, yeah, we could fuck up shit before that, but we couldn't actually destroy whole civilizations in an afternoon as you could in 1945. And probably by 1975, our population had reached beyond the carrying capacity of the earth without major injections of factory made artificial fertilizers and things of that sort. And Population has continued to skyrocket since. It's almost tripled since 1975. And so we're very deep into the regime where we are way overusing the ecological services that are provided to us by Mother Earth. And if we fuck that up, we're really screwed. And there's, of course, as you know, we both know, various other things that late stage Game A has brought us to, which many folks in the Game B world refer to as the meta crisis. Yeah. What do you think about that idea, the meta crisis? And in your mind, what are the, some of the aspects of things that are the negative outcomes from running game A without any modulation for the last 320 years? Well, not prepared for that question. I don't think it too much about the, that, that actually. And I would prefer not to, to focus too much on the, the problems that game A is causing, because I think those are kind of what everyone else is focusing on. And so, like I mentioned in my book, I chose to focus on solutions. And so I found that the main problem, of course, was this value game. So essentially what the game is, by the way, what we're playing is a game of value. And the thing that is uh, valuable in the world is property. And so the way in which the people get the value points, the money, is through their relationship through the property. And as you mentioned, you know, in the, in the 1700s, once they began the fractional reserve banking in that system, what that was, was the ability to, to extract more resources from the world <clears throat> for trade. And that's all it is. And all we've done is we've taken that game and maximized it and just grown it and keep continuing to grow it as fast as we can. And, and we see all the problems. So to, to, to talk about what it's doing is not as, as interesting for me as to talk about what we can do differently so that it doesn't do those things. Right, that's good. Let's, we'll, we'll just take it as a given. The world's fucked up and everybody knows it, God damn it. And we'll move on from there. Though I will suggest two things. One, Game A did a tremendous amount of good along the way. You know, in 16, 1700, most people are living in houses with dirt floors, were heating their houses. They lived in temperate zones with dirty fires. They had, didn't have any glass in their windows. They had respiratory diseases. Half the children died before they were five. Widespread famines where hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes millions of people died, were still happening. Uh, even in Europe, right? Famously, the potato famine in Ireland, you know, 1844, killed at least a million people, drove another couple of million into exile. So Game A solved a lot of problems. You know, there was a reason that you know, Game A was essentially celebrated for quite a long while. Of course, there were some negatives along the way, particularly the horrors of imperialism and colonialism. But overall, it has taken humanity a very long way. And it's always good to remember that, that, sure. that game A is not a, by any means a unilateral bad. No. And I'd argue that it was powerful, the most powerful system ever created by far by humanity. But it has no breaks. It has no ability to say enough. Exactly. And we have rushed past the limits of, in so many ways. 
a necessary evolutional uh, progression that we went through. However, I think we we stayed in it for way too long, unnecessarily. We could have changed probably a hundred years ago with some more focus and more. If there wasn't sabotage, if there wasn't already winners who were manipulating the the game and preventing us from evolving, as I like to you know, like I like, like call my book an evolution of economics, we could have, we should have evolved hundred years ago. But I agree with you one hundred percent. Game A has was wonderful, and it was, it is responsible for the majority of the innovation, material possessions, and the goods and production, all the stuff that we have in the world was a, obviously came from that. And that's good. But as you know, too much of something good will also kill you. Yeah, indeed. And, and you know, to your point, and this is, to my mind, the, the gateway to thinking in a game B way is there were pathways to have gotten off game A in various, at various times. Or another way to say that is the game A that we have is the result of a series of frozen accidents, right? That things that happen, sometimes for very self-serving reasons, sometimes a small group of people made them happen. Very famously, the Federal Reserve, right, was a small group of people, maybe a hundred, who just, some of it for self-serving and some of them thought it was for the good of the world. And they got together on Jekyll Island, famously, and crafted the Federal Reserve and that got pushed through by Woodrow Wilson. And that switch changed things in a very powerful way and, and led to the mass industrialization of the U.S. The U.S. was the industrial power of the world by 1913 when the Federal Reserve came into being, but nothing like it was by 1950. So the period between, say, 19, well, actually 1913 and 1975 was powered by first the Federal Reserve and then the Bretton Woods institutions, the monetary institutions like the World Bank. The monetary, what's the world? The monetary fund, the fuck's the name of that? Anyway, all the stuff that came in after World War II. And then, you know, another one, which is what really let Game A off the leash and led to what I'd call late stage Game A was Nixon taking the U.S. off the gold standard in 1971. At that point, finance had no restraint at all, right? It was uh, just, yeah, Katie bar the door, we're off to the races. And it was since that point that finance became dominant in our society. It was always had more power than it should have, but since 1971, it's accelerating until 2006. 40% of all corporate profits in America were from the uh, finance, insurance, and real estate sectors. I mean, what the fuck, right? <laughs> but the, here's the good news, and as I get back to this Game B gateway, and I think you're, you're someone who's trying to open the door, which is all these things were human creations. None of this stuff came down from Mount Sinai with Moses, right? There isn't a tablet that says central banker managed fractional reserve banking shall be the way we organize our economies. Every one of these was either a frozen accident or a conscious design. And we, the citizens, have the power to change that. We can create new institutions and we should. Okay, before we go on, this is interesting. You have actually quite a long section, and we're not going to do justice to the whole section. So I read in the intro, you consider yourself an anarchist now. Of course, a lot of people say anarchist. That's just disorder and chaos. And, you know, those of us who have read in the literature know that, yes, there could be that kind of anarchy. But there's also a formal political theory of anarchy, which is how do you organize living without a state? Maybe you could say a bit more about what anarchy is to your mind. Sure. Well I talk a lot about it in the book. and Yeah, a lot, whole bunch. <laughs> I didn't want to, but I, as I went through it, I realized that, you know, maybe I have to because a lot of people don't seem to know it. But essentially, anarchy means without rulers. And like I mentioned in my book, if you remove, if there are no rulers, and what do rulers do? They make rules, right? And what do rules do? They help to organize us so that we don't kill each other. So we know what the game is. So if you remove rulers, though, then then you question, then the rules come into question. And if people don't have faith and, and the rules are no longer there to organize things, then there's going to be chaos. And so eventually, of course, anarchy came to also be synonymous with chaos. But that's not true. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to have rulers. You can still have rules and be and have anarchism. And that would be stateless or, or without, you know, because the state is our today our ruler. And uh, David Graeber, who you quote a few times, one of my favorites, has a lot of good, a lot of good material on how one could imagine living without a state. I really love his book, The Utopia of Rules, for instance. 
which is a brilliant book. And of course, one of the foundations. And if you haven't read this, I will give you $100, which is debt the first 5,000 years, right? That's a must read for anybody that's interested in these questions. Absolutely. But I will also say, and this is a, a Jim Ruttism, probably more than it is even a Game Bism. I frankly don't think that the way forward is going to be compounded by the 18th, 19th, or 20th century isms. No. You know, we can borrow from them, but the problems they confronted were very different than the problems we confront. And that uh, I think of the challenge of the way forward is to craft a new way, a new social operating system that borrows where appropriate from these previous thinkers, but really starts with a pretty blank sheet of paper. And that, you know, again, in game B land, sometimes you get into these ugly arguments between the capitalists and the socialists. And I go, just shut the fuck up, dudes. You know, I'm not really interested in either. I'm interested in the ideas, and I can quote them endlessly of Adam Smith and Karl Marx, but neither of their systems are appropriate for the next hundred years. God damn it. So stop arguing about the isms. No doubt. It was a function of their time, though. You know, the what the 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 isms had limitations of, of the solutions, the game B as it is, wasn't possible, really, uh, at least certainly not during Marx in the uh, Absolutely. Not to say that the isms weren't appropriate for their era, but the isms were built for, I mean, without computer networks, without blockchains, without, you know, lots of stuff. Yeah, you can't do uh, game B things, probably. No doubt. Well, from my perspective, the, the reason why I say this is because, you know, if we're looking at game A as, uh, as you know, who's managing property and collecting value for our contribution, our production, and and through the movement of stuff, then that's game A. And so the socialists and the commun- uh, the and the capitalists are both, you know, say, their argument essentially break breaks down to who should own the stuff, who should be the primary owner, if you will, of the of the value. But see, I identified that as the actual problem itself. Yeah, I think you were absolutely right about that. That state capitalism, as the forms of socialism. Uh, really have been just another form of game A, just as you say, who owns the property, who owns the capital goods in particular. And you haven't actually gotten to the, to the problem. Now, let's move on here a little bit. And this is, this is again, a key question that all people interested in social change ask, which is, do we reform the system as it is by you know voting for the slightly less evil motherfucker, or do we do something else? And you pulled out one of my very favorite quotes from Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. It's a very popular uh, quote, obviously. A lot of people are using it nowadays. Bucky was obviously ahead of his time. If you read his stuff, the man is just beyond brilliant, certainly. But yes, you're not going to be voting for, you know, uh, change, be, at least not in the present way. I, there is a obviously I have a chapter transition that I talk about a little bit briefly about this kind of stuff. But so I don't personally believe that we're going to be able to vote, so to speak, at least in the in the political arena. There may you know we may be able to vote theoretically, kind of as a culture, as a as a peoples on Earth, but not through our, you know it's not going to happen through voting some politician in America or Europe or any of that because what are you asking them to change and you can't change yourself that is you know like why can't you propose it yourself yep and i'm going to hit a cartoon that you posted in the book i thought that was pretty funny it was 80s 90s double aughts and 10s i could make it the 20s but in the 80s pick up your litter and save the earth right 90s recycle and you can save the earth Double aughts, reduce your carbon footprint. You can save the earth. Tens, that work 20s or 30s, completely restructure global economic systems, and you may be able to save a remnant of humanity. <laughs> That's a damning description of our reality right now. Again, consider the psychology of what our children are going through. Imagine you and I, when we were younger, don't even tell me that you thought the world was going to end. Well, no. we had the nukes hanging over no, our no, head. The, the nukes, yeah, but end in the sense that like this is feels more real. The, the nukes was obviously a real, it's a real potential catastrophe. However, this is uh, uh, this is actually happening. You know, these children really believe that that the nuclear bomb basically was already thrown. It's just going to take 100 years till it lands, but it's it's already been launched. And so the psychology of these kids, I, God, man, I don't know what they're going through. It's got to be terrible. 
Yeah, but I do remind them we did have the nukes and we thought the nukes were real. I grew up seven miles from the White House and we just assumed there'd be a white flash and that'd be all she wrote. But it, it is true that we're back to those days and in some ways in a more pernicious way that it's not a bunch of rolls of the dice. If it comes up snake eyes, you die. As you say, it's we're fucked, right? Unless we do something different. We keep doing what we're doing. We're just fucked. And, and kids know that today. Yeah, it's sad. It's not good. Got a lot of other stuff we could we could do, but I want to skip over that and get to the plan itself. All right. So uh, now as we start getting closer to the plan itself, under your terminology in game A, we have three classes of people, masters, slaves, and the useless. It's funny. I often throw out the fact that, you know, one of the signs that game A is just broken and depraved is how can the richest country in the world have thousands of people living homelessly on the street. That's horrible. I mean, you know, no society, no decent society, no society anywhere in the world has ever done that before. Yeah. And it's not because these individuals, by the way, don't want to play or don't want to participate in society. It's that they physically we can't. They literally can't. The They don't have any property. They don't have any capital. They don't have any assets. They have nothing from which to participate in this exchange game of trading that we're playing. And so they can't play. And so they be, they, they've been rendered useless. And this is not my phrase, by the way. This is not my term. I don't, I don't consider them useless. That's a negative uh, you know, phrasing. That's Yuval Harari uses that term, and he calls these folks useless because the system has made them useless. You know, it's not no again, it's no knock on these folks. You know, they they don't deserve to be there. They deserve to be able to participate in society how to whatever degree they want. And if that means you know they don't want to participate at all, so be it. They should have that right, but they should be able to survive. Yeah. And you know, again, I always use that as a metric. Is, is any proposed what comes next, any proposed game B, is it designed such that there aren't people starving on the streets, right? Or living, or living like animals on the streets. That's just fucking unbelievable that the richest country in the history of the world would have hundreds of thousands of people living on the streets. It's just crazy. So now we're moving forward a little bit further. Let's skip over generator functions and that kind of stuff. Multipolar traps, even. It's interesting, but we talk about that other places. So next, one of the ideas thrown around by the tech lords is UBI as the solution to all these problems. And oh, by the way, that probably would take care of the homeless problem. But why is UBI not enough? Because of the nature of the uh, game that we're playing, creating currency in, like I mentioned, is property. And so when you're creating more of this property as UBI and you're introducing into the game, you're going to affect the the values and prices of other things. So essentially what you're doing is you have to continue playing the circulatory game and you're going to have to figure out ways of redistributing the currency in order to be able to provide the UBI. And so, but the problem is, is that the primary problem of, of game A is that it doesn't seem to match production with ecological sustainability, that it doesn't have any of those considerations. Well, if you provide UBI for folks and they have the, the capital to be able to purchase the, the goods to be, that are going to be produced, there's still no conscious production of efficiency, of, of renewability. None of those back-end production is, 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 is addressed. It's only addressed on poverty. So sure, you can give more money to people, and you can provide more stuff, but is that is that going to change the trajectory of, of the ecological collapse? And I don't believe it will. Correct. That is correct. That is the, actually the right answer why UBI is not enough, which is it does not apply any breaks to the system. It does improve social justice a bit. I mean, again, the simplest way to do UBI, is, oh, well, how would you finance it? I got a simple way to finance it, which is 15% sales tax on everything. And that proceeds go back per capita to every individual. And so the average person would get 85% of 15% of the you know, per capita GDP, which is enough to live on. Uh, so it can be done, but it does not apply any breaks to game A. It, it does increase social justice a little bit. So it's a good thing, but not enough. If I may make one point about that, though, as I mentioned later in that book, is that uh, while I'm against UBI in a game A circulatory system, for the obvious reasons, um, but I'm not against UBI as a potential transition strategy. It is possible that we can still use UBI as simply, quickly to eliminate and immediately ameliorate the uh, the problems of poverty for most people while we make the transition to the new currency system. So that there is a possibility that UBI can still be beneficial and necessary. 
up front. That said, just doesn't solve all the problems. And I'm agree, I agree with you. Right. It, the, our answer shouldn't be like, let's just do the UBI and we're done with it. No, no. You just added gasoline to the fire and you didn't put out the fire. And so that would be terrible. That would be the worst case scenario in my book. But as a system for the whole of, of humanity, certainly it would solve the problem of, of these individuals who are temporarily poor. But as a system, as a family, we're still fucked if we did that only. Yeah. I'm with you 100% that I do believe it's a good thing in the context of game A, but it doesn't actually solve the game A problem. So now let's move towards your solutions. Like a good architect, you start with a goal and you put forth your goal as sovereignty, opportunity, and liberty. Very short gloss on those three before we start jumping into the details. Sovereignty is the, the idea that you should be in charge of your life in all areas of your life. Opportunity is, uh, again, likewise, is that you should be have the opportunity to participate in society in any manner in which you want. And then obviously liberty is likewise, is you should be able to have the participation through the society that you're responsible for your actions, but that you are in control of your actions. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like good things, right? And of course, any of these terms can be bastardized and, and, and made negative. And, and anyone, of course, you know, Orwellian speak can use proper terms to describe their proposals and whatnot in these glowing terms of freedom and sovereignty and liberty. But it's the actual details in which the, the reason why I used this terminology is because the plan actually offers these things in reality. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give just a, sh- a foreshadowing here for the audience. I don't want you to react because we'll go into more detail later. You essentially break your plan up into two big parts. One is a currency system where you move from our current circulatory system of the currency to a flow-based system, and then a fundamental rethinking of property, essentially. And so people should keep their ears out for those two things as we move forward. Before we do that, though, do set a little ground as you do. Maybe talk a little bit about the game A uh, model of owner, trader, and consumer. Sure. I mean, when I came up upon my idea, as I mentioned in the book, it, it was it wasn't I, I didn't I wasn't studying uh, Marxism. I didn't understand the game A from that lens, even though I was you know viewing it obviously from that lens because that's what the world that we live in is through controlling resources and exchange and all of that. So I didn't have the terminology or the knowledge of the Marxist history and all any of that. To be honest, I didn't know any of that. I didn't even know what communism was. And I lived and was born in a fucking communist country. I still didn't really know what it was at that time when I came up with this idea. But so really what I ended up doing was I ended up tinkering with the economic equation such that it cha- fundamentally changed the manner in which value can flow, basically, you know, money. And so by redirecting the flow of currency, we can simultaneously then change where the initial value comes from. What is valuable? How does it flow? Is it only flow through our exchange uh, through possessions or does it flow some other manner? And so when I realized that money itself was a fictional kind of tool and, and that, that it can be created and distributed and flows and, and moves about because it's fictional, that opened the door for uh, imagining a new relationship, if you will, of, of how things flow and are exchanged and, and likewise, and how value itself is flows and, and is determined to the individual players. In the current game A, all value flows through exchange. You and I, the only way we can capture value is through some method of exchange, period. There is no other way. You have to have something and trade it for something else. There, no one's going to just give you the value, aside from, of course, the, you know, the modern welfare state. Or the family, of course, right? Your mother still cooks you dinner when you show up at Thanksgiving, right? Yes, but there's, a, there's an exchange there. It was free for, for you, but not for her. Uh, she had to buy those things. She had to exchange something for them, and she gave them to you for free. So, But nevertheless... So I, you can go move on from this. Okay. Yeah, we'll skip over that little section. It was kind of interesting about owners, traders, and consumers, but probably uh, too much detail. I do want you, though, to hit briefly, because I know all monetary cranks obsess about this, and I'm certainly guilty of having done so in the past. And that's a brief description of how the money supply currently works in game A. 
Very important that people know this. And almost nobody actually has their shit straight. I would say you do. You did not. I didn't find a single error in the way you described it. I appreciate that. Thank you. By the way, which is really, okay, now I'm going to say this. I studied money. I've been studying money all my life, as most of us have. Of course, some of you and I more into it in, intimately than many others. I actually, well, you just said that I got it accurate. Believe it or not, there was pieces there that I was still confused about, even just as, as recently as a year ago. And so even during the research through this book, I actually was, was missing something. But all money essentially is comes from credit, which banks have access to issue credit in the game, private commercial banks, to whomever they want. But generally speaking, obviously, for the purposes of making a profit, they don't just issue this credit without securing it in some form or another. How do they secure it? Well, what they're doing is they're issuing you the credit so that you can then purchase some property that has value. And in so doing, they can be secured that they can give you this credit because if you don't give it back to them, they will just take your property and sell it and, and then it'll be fine. But all money is basically created through debt. And particularly, it's very, very important for people to understand that when a bank makes the one, the one factor that they've somehow been managed to obfuscate is when a bank makes a loan, they are not loaning the depositors money. What a bank does is they're creating new money, actually, and approximately 90% of the money in circulation in the United States and 95% in the UK, which is actually even more banking intensive than the US, is actually created out of thin air, quite literally, by the banks. And they issue a loan and they literally just put new money in your account. However, what people often miss, and you do mention this, though maybe you don't put as much emphasis on it as I would, is that... Also, when loans are repaid, whenever you repay capital on a loan, you are destroying money, actually. The money disappears. And it's this a modulation function that the banks have, which actually is good. It's one of the reasons why the invention of fractional reserve banking turned out to be this gigantically positive thing for humanity, particularly when it was in a very capital intensive stage of industrialization, because the banks kind of breathe in and breathe out. You know, they breathe money in, they breathe money out. In the United States, other than mortgages, the average length of a loan is about three or four years. So the whole money supply actually turns over every three or four years, which allows money to be reallocated from one sector to another. It's pretty cool. On the other hand, there's some problems with it. Built in negative and positive feedback loops, unfortunately. You know, when things start getting hot, the banks say, ah, oh, I can make more money by lo- inventing more money and putting it out there. And well, we're all going to get rich on the interest, right? Well, so the money supply grows, the economy overheats beyond what the real needs are and the capacity of people to execute. Prices go up. Then guess what? It crashes. And then the banks overreact. They call in loans, even very sound ones, right? And so and so the working money supply decreases. And essentially, I'm pretty convinced after having read 150, 200 books on this topic, 500 scientific papers, written computer simulations, that if it was not for this very interesting invention from 1694, our business cycles would be much, much milder. The recessions, the booms and the busts would be much, much milder than than they are uh, due to this institutional structure. But there wouldn't be as much productive capacity. Credit has the in- interesting ability to induce production, to, to begin to begin things. So one other point I'd like to make, though, is that with this whole money thing, is that so initially what you have is you've got the initial thing of value, the resource itself, right? Let's the trees of the U.S., uh, the cotton, whatever it was that we, the the initial people, the owners, extract that that initial property of value. That then becomes money. That becomes wealth, so to speak. And then the bankers, with their credit, are able to then give more money to, to people who already have existing money. So, but. The existing money, it all started from the value of the, of the property. And then that, of course, got transferred over to this other physical property called gold. And then we use that as the basis of, of accounting and, and wealth. And that we measured that as wealth. And so what did the country do? The country would issue this paper currency to begin the game of circulation with currency, but being backed by the physical gold. Now, what the gold represents kind of is the same as is the other physical wealth of the world, right? A house is wealth, a train is 
wealth, a car, real, you know, all these things that we produce are valuable. They, they are worth something. So they add wealth to the world. And so currency is just used to, to essentially trade, exchange that wealth. And so we're playing this huge game of, of capturing wealth through the stuff. But the primary source of wealth itself is still, even though, as we say, banks are you know, issuing credit and creating money out of thin air, so to speak, they are. But so too do people, the primary extractors, for, so for example, Saudi Arabia, the people who own the oil, they're extracting. Where did they, how come they get to keep the value? <laughs> what did they do? You know, just because they were born there and they claimed it for their family? Come on, that's a joke. As you say, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? That's been essentially the base law for a long fucking time, right? So, and by the way, if you're a little stronger, you just take it away from the other guy, and now it's yours, right? Right. So, but if you look at, at this uh, problem of the game that we're playing from through a family perspective, you would immediately recognize that what these people are doing is they're claiming things that that aren't actually theirs. They're the families. They just took them from us. You know, who does the Amazon forest belong to? It belongs to all of us. Why does only some people in Brazil get to decide, or some capitalist who bought the land? from the people from Brazil. So the whole game of primitive accumulation, as Marx called it, is the beginning of the problem of the game. So right there, the the where wealth in the world, all wealth in the world comes from is the earth, period. What's valuable in the world? You know, the stuff, the things. Well, though, yeah, to my point earlier, uh, since a long while, value added is also hugely important. You can have a rock and a stick and some sinew, but take some cleverness to put the rock on the stick and connect them well so it doesn't come off when you chop a tree down. And and that's important too. That's sometimes underestimated in the formation of real. We go back to the debates of, of you know, what Smith and Marx and all these other guys were talking about. Where does this value come from? Why is this? Yeah, value the famous from? labor theory of value, which isn't quite right either. Right, yeah. What about the labor? So, but see, no one's going to not say no, okay, both are true. Labor is valuable, duh, but so is the stuff. Both are valuable, okay, we can agree on that. My point is, why are we distributing value? Why are we determining value and distributing the value tokens through only the value of stuff, through exchange? That's nonsense to me. At least it's not necessary any longer, considering that we have digital tools of record keeping that can overcome the trust issues that you know, that physical currency used to uh, provide. That's what gold was. It was a physical representation, something that you can trust. You knew this thing because it was real, right? Yeah, you could calculate the density using Archimedes principle yeah. and make sure you weren't being ripped off by adulteration, et cetera. But we don't need to do these. We don't need to play these games of valuing only the property. Property has value. We can still have prices. We can still use prices to determine uh, allocation of resources and distribution of resources and all and all that. However, how we distribute the value token to the individual who can then participate in the market, uh, decide where to, what to buy and, and where to, those can be separate now because we have digital tools to keep records. We didn't have that 100 years ago. There was no way these guys could have ran a game B in the form that I'm proposing because some people actually had this idea of using different currencies of maybe not a flow currency like, you know, that I'm talking about, but they did have ideas of, of the currency what was it called? Uh, it would lose value. Demorage, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, demorage. Yeah. And, and all these other notions so that they can kind of, you know, prevent some of the problems of, of inequality and accumulation of the, of the value token itself. But nevertheless, the game itself was still determining value to the individuals based on exchanges of property. And that's the problem. It, we don't need to do that. Yeah, that's a you know, very good point. I'm, I'm going to use this as a point to hype my own earlier solution a little bit. I, as I have a talk at the Santa Fe Institute on dividend money, an alternative to central banker managed fractional reserve banking money. Mm -hmm. And I will say it is insufficient. And I wrote that in 2015. And I would write something quite a bit more radical today, maybe not quite as radical as Ramsey, but, but more radical than that. But it's worth a look. And it addresses many, many of these issues, but comes to a more conservative conclusion. And with that, let's hop over to, we're getting closer to the punchline here, folks. You know, in game A, as we talked about before, money dominates everything, circulating money, right? I put money in, I want money back. In game B, your version of it, you basically propose that money move from being the circulating thing 
to a flow thing. And I must admit, there's some parts of the mechanics I'm not 100% sure, and we'll get to those. But before we get into the down into the mechanics, uh, you divide the flows into basically three buckets. One you call UBI, the other you call proof of value, and the other you call bonus. Maybe you could talk briefly about that so people will know what we're talking about when, when we reference them going along. Sure. So in the last uh, few months and since I released the book, I've been working on creating, writing a summary with infographics to explain some of these flows to make it uh, easier for people to quickly grasp these concepts and see what exactly what the hell I'm talking about so that it'll be easier to understand. And I apologize for not having finished that in time for this interview. It would have really helped. But nevertheless, so you, essentially the difference is that in a flow currency, we can issue the currency to the individuals as a UBI, which is fair, equal to everybody. The UBI should be an amount that is sufficient to, generally speaking, to be able to purchase at least the, the basics of food, some clothing, and some entertainment, right? The minimal, bare minimal, so to speak. And then the second one, the proof of value is essentially is that when you do things in the world, and everyone does things in the world, right? You're going to live, you're going to play, you're going to work, you're going to learn. When you do those things, you're going to collect more value. Now, and it'll be fair. It's like a menu, right? Given certain things or certain ages would collect a certain value. Uh, and there's some flexibility there, but nevertheless, so it's fair, it's equitable. You get to decide when to learn, how much to learn, where to play, how much to play, where to work, how much to work. So all these things can be done in a fair playing field without you having to worry about running out of money because you're getting UBI. You can always participate to get more if you want more. And then the third one, I think I called it, uh, what, what was the term? term? Bonus. 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 Essentially, it's profit, basically. But profit, I, I think I used the word bonus because instead of profit, is because People generally think of profit as as this equation of you know buying inputs and then selling it, and then that's the difference between your you know in, your costs and your in your sale price is your profit. Well, that is only one measurement, right? So you don't necessarily have to distribute the bonus, which is the profit, simply based on that equation. That can be a part of it, but we should be able to measure other elements of the production process, like uh, Kate Raw Rawworth is doing with her donor economics. Things like efficiency is. Did the enterprise, you know, are, can they reduce the amount of, of energy they're using? Can they reduce uh, the amount of materials they use? Can they recycle these things? Can they, you know, all these other metrics that we can incentivize to incentivize production so that it can be better, so they can produce the things that we actually want to produce, not just a singular equation of profit that we have today. It's so silly. Anyway, so b by distributing the currency in those three methods, would assure that a person would never run out of currency. You would always have value to use to acquire some good that you want from the market. You always will always be able to buy food, clothes, have access to activities, you know, travel, whatever it is that you want, it's there for you. And if you want more, well, then you know what you need to do. Just go work more, right? Or, or participate more, and then you'll have it. But the neat thing about this currency system, the flow currency, is that is that because it's flowing directly to you, not it's not circulating to you from somebody else. You didn't get the UBI through redistribution. It didn't come to you from somebody else's pocket. Okay, and likewise with the proof of value, the money that you got, the currency that you got, didn't come to you from somebody else's pile. It didn't come from a bank. It didn't come from a capitalist. You got it. You collected it directly because it's direct value recognition for your contribution to the world. You as a human being, you're valuable. All you have to do is do things, you collect the credit directly. Now, you're collecting this currency through these participation uh, you know, things. You're collecting it through the production process of doing good things, and, and your peers are all measuring these things and, and, and creating the bonus metrics, et cetera. You're collecting all this bonus. Now, you got all this money, right? And so if it's not circulating, so it's not circulating because when you go and you go and purchase something, you go and buy a shoe, some shoes or clothes or car, whatever it is that you purchase, once you purchase that item, the money then simply disappears. It doesn't circulate to the people who produced that car or the shoes because it doesn't have to anymore. Those individuals, you might recall, the actual people, not the corporation, forget about the corporation for a moment, it doesn't exist, technically speaking, forget about it. Forget about the fucking country, it doesn't exist. The only people who collect, who need to collect currency are people. And because the people in the production capacity are already recognized for their contribution and their value, they're collecting it. You don't, the money doesn't have to circulate from me to them in order to pay them. 
we recognize their labor, they collect it, they in turn use it to buy whatever they want to buy from the market or stereo or whatever, the money deletes and it's gone. And there's no issues of, of the problems that we have today of, of utilizing the money to manipulate one another, to control our own labor. So that is completely wiped out. And that's very, I have to say, a very innovative idea, this idea of the money goes direct, let's say it goes from the central ledger to my personal ledger. If I spend it, it disappears and yeah. then new money is issued again. That's a very radical idea. You can never run out. I mean, it's kind of like today, you can't run out of money even now because it's fake. It's credit. There's no limit technically. Yeah. Modern monetary theory says just keep on keep on cranking. That's going to end up a disaster, but that's another story for another day. The only the only limit, you know, to uh, to the modern money creation is that it's tied to the real world, obviously. Yeah. So so I think I understand it. So it's created magically on the ledger. Everybody has an account, mm-hmm. which they had uh, you to go into some detail on how you do proof of humanity, et cetera. Let's assume that works. It's hackable, probably, mm-hmm. but if we police it police it no. enough, it'll be good enough, right? Always a, always a little bit of scammery at the edge, but we yeah, we can tolerate that. Uh, it comes into my account, I buy shoes. The money disappears, literally. That doesn't circulate back to the person that provided me the shoes, right? So now let's track it back to the next step. How did the shoes come into being? Why would anybody create shoes just out of the goodness of their heart if they're not going to get paid for? It? Well, they're not creating out of the goodness of their heart. Remember, they're creating it because they're involved in the production process, because they like doing what they're doing. They, they, they want to do something. And so when in the course of you doing something, that's value creation right there. So they don't need the money from you because they already got it from the, from the work. So now if they don't produce, if, if nobody produces anything, we're all just doing nothing. Well, guess what? We're going to die. But no one's going to, you're going to be able to see Everything that's being done, because we're, we're working on a shared ledger, we're, we're able to, to manage and account for all of the resources, where they're flowing, who they're flowing to. Now, these resources, they still have price. We're still using a currency. They, there is still accounting. But the point here is, is that the accounting in, during the production process doesn't determine the value flow to the individual's by solely it's a it's a it's a it's one of the metrics sure you know like the profit metric can still be uh, a metric on which companies are doing better so that we can say hey look these guys are better than you guys you guys according to the accounting you know we don't we don't need you to produce this anymore so you the resources are not going to flow to you any longer you can't afford it because your accounting says you're negative therefore your operation has to shut down so it's a it's a mechanism of being able to still kind of close down people, production processes that that we don't need, that the market doesn't want, uh, have a need for, desire for, and then also open up ones that they do want. Because if you see a need that's not being met, you are incentivized. Not only are you incentivized, again, for your proof of value, your actual labor, but there's a bonus too. By you producing something that people want, you're going to get even more money for that. Not just the money, though, though, Jim, as we know. You're not just getting money, dude. You're getting recognition. You're getting respect from your peers. So we know that what's valuable in the world, it obviously, is not just the resources. It's our relationship with one another, our status, all these other things that you can't quantify through the value, uh, uh, through the currency and through the value measurement. But that's something I would add to your system in, the, in a version 2.0 is some formal recognition for those kinds of things that are orthogonal to the actual currency system. Them. But that's another story for another day. So now, th- now we're getting to the meat of the matter. And of course, the classic pushback on systems like this is, you know what the question is, the calculation problem, right? Mm-hmm. Which is uh, the holding started way back, but it was most clearly stated by Ludwig von Mises in 1922 in a paper called The Calculation Problem, which says that figuring out what to make, how to allocate labor, allocate resources, et cetera, is a problem beyond central planning, beyond any form of coordination other than edge calculation so that the participants themselves make the decision, hmm, there's not enough shoe manufacturers in the United States. I'm going to start a shoe manufacturer. And by my guess, by the time I buy the leather, buy the other materials, hire people, pay the middleman, I can make a profit. So there's a signal that goes all the way from the transaction back to the decision to organize the work and even what kind of shoes to make, right? If I make 
like Russian style clunky grandmother shoes. No one's going to buy them. And famously, Russia made as many shoes as the United States, but nobody wanted them right? because there was no signal back, no subtle real time signal back. Mm-hmm. And so that would be, I would say, the first pushback here. How does the decision to make shoes, particularly shoes of a specific design, a specific mix of sizes, colors, et cetera, get made in a system like this? So it's it's a dance between the, the consumers and the producers, right? Is the, the consumers are telling you the two ways. Number one, they they may be pre-telling you, hey, look, I want, I'm gonna, I'm, I like red shoes, or I'm gonna want to buy a TV, you know, six months, or I'm gonna be, this is what I'm gonna be purchasing. This is kind of the goods that I might need. So you can you can kind of guess all that stuff, but at the end of the day. There's also information through the market of what's being purchased. Like, what are people actually forget about what they said they wanted? What are they actually buying? Right. And so, all these things are happening in, through the market. Now, now, the same mechanism that Game A uses, this profit incentive, right? Just like saying, hey, look, if you take the risk, if you are willing to, to go out there, you can make more money if you do all this stuff. And it's the same thing in my version, except that there's no risk. The risk is that you will fail and you can't continue doing what you, know, you want to to do or produce because you suck and other people are better than you. But the reward is the same in the sense that if you do this, you can make more money. Through the bonus, through the bonus. Oh, right. And so, so here's an idea I had while I was reading this. I actually wrote it down in the notes, which is if we think of three knobs, let's say we have a total amount of this personal credit flowing in the three buckets, UBI, proof of value, and bonus. You can adjust what percentage goes into which of the three buckets. And if you put all of the money in the bonus bucket, it's essentially game A, very damn close to it, right? Um, no, no, it's not because, again, the it, it would still be a, a better game. It, it would – no, because the currency would still be flow in this manner. Like Remember, the, the, the bonus is an accounting – is based on accounting of, of trade, of exchange, like the prices of the stuff. So there's a number there. There's accounting there. But the bonus itself isn't j- solely determined just by the actual accounting. There's more to it than just that. It can be more complicated. Yeah, that's actually, I'm going to have to do a thought experiment later. What would happen if you took Remzi's model and put it 100% into a bonus? How would that work out? It's just interesting. Well, these are the kind of things, though, Jim, that I was, I'm hoping that are possible, and they probably are, to simulate. Yeah, well, yeah, we certainly should. Have, actually, I can tell, talk to you about how to do that, actually, if you're interested. But the key here is that the primary thing I think I want to show the world or, or introduce to the world is this idea that currency should not circulate as property because it is in this it is in this form in which we all are basically fighting and trying to you know kill each other for and manipulating each other over over control and access to because that's the only source of value. But by removing that as that that's the secondary. Like obviously we want to produce and incentivize people towards production and distribution. Distribution. And we need an allocation system of prices to be able to determine you know, where to allocate resources. Those are all true, but that's why we have a pricing system. That's why we're still maintaining a currency. However, we've separated it from the mere equation of, 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 of profit. Yeah, this is all very interesting. Again, the, the, you know, the, the classic challenge is that the reason uh, for circulating money is that it provides a free signal on what to do. And so the question is, do you have an alternative way to get that signaling good enough that you don't end up like the Soviet Union, which had every resource known to man? Russia has more natural resources than the United States does. And yet they couldn't get their shit together because they couldn't figure out this coordination problem. And currency, circulating currency is a signaling modality is really all that it is. And there's giant value from that signaling modality. I just want to make, I just want to drill in a little bit. So let's go to another question that I had, your proof of value, i.e. you're you're being paid for working. You get a UBI, whether you want to sit around and jerk off all day or not, right? And then if you do decide to work or go to school or something, you're paid a, a POV. Now, this is, again, you, know, you address it-ish, but some work is more desirable than others, right? And yet on your scale, it's based on a menu of, you know, what kind of work it is, how skilled it is, but it's not really fine grain. No, and it may turn out way more people want to end up being yoga teachers than working in a shoe factory. Mm-hmm. And again, in circulating money, you know, the von Mises problem. Well, guess what? If there's too many yoga teachers, there ain't enough students. Very, very quickly, they go out of business and they stop being yoga teachers. Well, same here. You know, you, you just because you are allowed to do whatever you want to do, that doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean that the market or the community actually values that thing. And so, 
the difference between, of course, this and the central planning of this is not central planning of the you can have this should be a combination of central planning in the in the in the sense of centrally managing how much resources to extract from the earth and where to extract them, but where to flow those resources isn't planned, isn't determined by some agency or some, like like it was in the Soviet Union. We're going to you know ship this many trees or this many shoes or rubber or whatever it was. No, this here, it would be individuals. It would be individuals within communities who are doing these things and so they're able to you able to start a, you know a, an enterprise a corporation whatever let's, let's walk down this road well, this kind of gets into the next part which is the community credit part so let's, if you want to talk about community credit part a little bit you can do that in this story so two people decide they want to start a yoga studio right and so they get together and as i understood your community credit piece they come to the community and they say we need a little resource so the community's bank of space Community says, all right, this sounds sort of reasonable. Let's create a, a yoga studio. We don't know if we have too many yoga studios or not because we don't see a price signal. We don't, there's, there's no way to know if we have too many yoga studios or not, probably. Well, you can because you have digital uh, mapping technology that maps and tells you everything that exists in the world, even in your community, instantly. Okay, that's, that's a good point. So, so, we, so we know how many people are currently using them. How many people are doing yoga every day, at least willing to pay for it, right? And so we do know that. So you can make some extrapolation. Is it reasonable to add another yoga studio? So let's say you do you do add one. Well, it turns out that these two people suck at running a yoga studio. You know, they just don't know enough about yoga. They're unpleasant. They don't keep the place clean, right? They just suck, right? And so this thing has been authorized by the community. It's been given space. It's been given a little startup capital. And here's the important part. It's now hooked into the POV. So the two people that run this yoga studio get paid for showing up every day, even though they're doing a shitty job. How does the cycle close and they get shut down? Yeah, so uh, the exact details will uh, vary from community to community because the idea here is to allow communities the maximum opportunity within this flow currency system to do things how they want. So they may actually do things differently than other communities. But generally speaking, though, Jim, that it, the the users, the the people, the students, so to speak, the yoga studio, will essentially have some kind of a mechanism to tell you, hey, these guys suck. Or And through participation, if they're not going to that studio anymore, they're going somewhere else, well, then the resources, the calculation of the of the resources, is they're still there. We're still calculating the prices of the resources these individuals are using. They're still in account. But that the individuals themselves don't have to suffer the loss, so to speak, if they, if they risk, you know, because they're risking their kind of. So there's like in today's world, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're risking every time you're starting a company. There's risk there. Uh, but here, there's risk here too, but there's no risk of loss. There's only risk of you sucking and getting shut down. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, this is helping. So let's let me let me build the model a little further. So a virtual P and L is created by the computers in the cloud for for every unit, and you know, two fools yoga studio has the costs allocated to it of an imputed capital cost for the space plus the POV being paid to the two instructors. And oh, guess what? Nobody is paying for the service, so the P and L is a minus you know, $12,000 a month. And so then there has to be a governance mechanism, which says, you know, a naive reading of POV, it says you do whatever you want and we'll pay you per the menu, right? Well, that's true until someone stifles one of the organizations that says two fools yoga is a completely sucky thing. How does it kill? How does it get killed? You know, one of the beauties of capitalism is it gets killed automatically. It runs out of money. Well, here too, it would run out of money because those two brothers, morons, whatever, they while they may have the space, they may, because they may have already leased out the space for free from the community, may have already agreed to give them the space for a year or two, right? We don't know. And let's say it's a year. And, but, and it turns out these guys suck, but we can't get them rid of – the community can't get rid of them before the year is over yet because they still have – they got the lease for the year and, they, and we gave them. But here's the thing though, Jim. They have a credit account, right? So they still have some things that they need. They may very well have – at some point, the energy may be free, the water may be – all these other resources because they're plentiful. They may end up having them for free, but there's still going to be a cost of stuff, right? They're still going to have to buy equipment, some balls or – Not much. So that's why I use the yoga studio. You know, you don't need much, right? right. So you're right. They, they won't. But you're getting your POV. You're getting your salary for not doing dick and not investing anything and being a fucking fool. How do I stop them getting their POV? Well, that's exactly right. So so that enterprise, 
the two yoga instructors may continue to re- collect their proof of value through their labor, but they won't get any bonus because the, the no none of their customers are like them. There, there is no relative to the other yoga studios. They suck. And so the others are going to get the bonus. They're not. And so there's no profit for them. And if there are any physical materials that they actually need for the studio, anything they need to buy, and because they're not profitable, they're going to have to buy it from their own pocket and they won't want to do that. Well, it depends how big the POV is. Again, this gets to this ratio question. If the bonus is way bigger than the POV, it starts to look more like the solution to the calculation problem. To the degree that the POV is much bigger than the bonus, that looks more like salary. Because, you know, most businesses, salary costs are 65 to 70% of total revenue, right? So if POV is like about the size of salary, then, you know, the fools will just sit there, collect their salary, not do dick. No one shows up and, you know, they sit there and and watch Internet porn all day. This is a problem that is solvable with the flow currency system, though. But like, and, and again, that community, not every community is going to say you can have the place, you know, with regardless of the accounting for the whole year. No, no, they may say they may say there's a mechanism for us to remove you from that space if, if the community so decides. If it turns out your service is not wanted by the community and we have a limited space availability for other activities and whatnot that other people want to open up, well, then we're going to shut you down and give it to somebody else. Yeah, that's my, that's my point. Is there, has to be a, there has to be a kill switch on bad companies, right? And there can be. But remember, the, the idea here, though, though, Jim, is that to allow, and if you notice, I separated into three different communities, to allow the local community to make those decisions. The, the more closer that we allow individual people and their local community and so on and so forth to make decisions, the better. And I agree with that. That's a game B principle, subsidiarity. Uh, the, the closest to the people, the better. For mo- as much as you co- possibly can tolerate and a little bit more. I like what you said there because, you know, what you're alluding to is that, yes, see, while I haven't modeled the numbers, it, we can change the numbers of the UBI. We can change the proof of value numbers. And we can change the bonus allocation. So all these things in this formulation are changeable as necessary. So so we can prevent any issues like you just mentioned about, you know, these morons doing nothing, but, but they're collecting value. When it's not really valuable, that's not right. We can fix that. Because remember, we control the value points. Yeah, and, and then I think – but. You know, the way you describe POV, it's kind of menu based, so you can't, you can't change their salary, but you can shoot them. And, and so I would, I would suggest adding to your system the kill switch, that there's some mechanism by which enterprises can be killed by some democratic process or even some algorithm. Uh, okay, they've taken on no revenue for two months, right? And they've collected their POVs, and it's the kind of business that if you don't have revenue in two months, you obviously suck, so therefore you die, right? Exactly. No, there will oh, there will be for you happen to pick a business that basically doesn't buy anything and doesn't have anything. So that's a, that's why I picked it. That's why it's a pure example. But but we answered it. But but generally speaking, the majority of the enterprises have inputs that they have to pay for, and so there is an accounting, and so they can run out of credit and not be able to continue. And so the credit, just like in capitalism, it does determine what continues and what doesn't. Naturally, without the community saying, "Well, we you we." think you guys suck. No, the market said you guys suck. It's not us. The market is telling you stop. Yeah, see, in this case, it won't because they'll collect their salaries. They won't do dick. And so you need a, they need an alternative method to kill. No, it will, though, because like I just mentioned, they won't be able to continue to purchase things because they ran out of credit. Yeah, that's what I said, but in yoga studio, you don't need anything. Oh, no, hey, let's, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. You know, no, no system is perfect. I caught you on one corner case, so you need to fix that. But that's all right. You know, that's not bad, right? So now let's move on to the next area, which I also thought was very clever, is this concept of community credit. So you have credits that flow to directly to the person for buying things for themselves. And then if I understood it correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, the community credits also go to the person, but they have to then be sent from the person to a enterprise. It's called it's called a legal entity that represents them in some sense. So you like you mentioned three levels. I think you probably need more than three, but that's all right. So you have your face-to-face community, you have the equivalent of your county, and you have the equivalent of the state, something like that. Three different layers, right? And those get money from the central money machine every period. And they have things they're supposed to spend money on. You know, it might be like you give the example, and this is a very important, it's a big number, education. Somebody's got to be responsible 
for civilizing the uprising children. Otherwise, you end up with a bunch of goddamn savages, right? Now, we need something better than our, than our sausage factory, horrible state indoctrination schools. But to, alloc- to get really good teachers is not inexpensive. I mean, for, for a county-level governments in the United States, the number one expenditure by far is education. So that's a good test case. So let's say your test, uh, maybe regional is where education happens, or maybe it's local, I don't know. But some fairly substantial amount of money has got to flow into these legal fictions called regions, et cetera. So talk about that a little bit, how that works. So the idea is that, see, in a in a game A world, because everything's circulatory, the 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 community, the city and the state and the country, et cetera, has to have money in order to spend to buy things, right? Because we need roads, we need all these things, and somebody has to pay for it. There's no in the equation of capitalism, there's no ability to make a profit doing that. So therefore, some the money has to come from somewhere, right? And it comes through taxes. Okay. So in this system, what we're saying is, okay, since we're already distributing the currency directly to people, we're flowing the currency directly to individuals, we'll call that personal credit. That's your money that you can use to participate in the market to determine, to decide what you want to purchase and what you want to, where you want to spend your time, like some activity or a sporting event, concert, whatever. And then and likewise, so how are communities? Communities also have to buy physical things. They also have to buy materials for the schools, buildings, and you know, and cement, et cetera. So how are they going to get credit since, you know, in this game? Uh, okay, so then I decided, okay, why don't we just give it to these communities directly? So what we did, what I did is I separated into three separate, separate piles. I have a pile for the local community, and that can be a small village. It could be a, a, a city. You know, it doesn't matter the size because the numbers, the way that I calculated the flow of how much community credit this locality will get is going to be fair no matter where because it's based on population, okay? And so it won't matter how big or small your community is. Generally speaking, you're going to have an equitable flow of currency directly to you and access to resources. So we're going to flow a certain amount of credit, UBI basically, for the city, every month based on population to a local region. At the same time, we have another pool for the region and then in, in the global. And the reason being there is that some of the monies that it's used to, to allocate the resources of the world will either benefit the local, the regional, the global. And so it wouldn't make any sense for a local community to allocate their personal money that only ben- or mostly benefits the region or the globe. And so that's why I created the pools of a region and the globe as well, so that those uh, enterprises or the development projects that we want to, to do, you know, let's say massive solar farms or whatever, those benefit the whole world. They don't just benefit a local community per se. They could benefit the region. So why, why should only a local community use their uh, limited uh, res- currency, res- access to resources instead of the region? So by flowing the, the credit to these, now the difference between the personal credit and the community credit it's in the language. The personal credit is only for you. It can't be transferred from you to somebody else without an exchange. So you use it in the market to buy a finished good, a book, a computer, you know, TV, car, whatever. Once you bought it, the money's disappeared. However, you still own the thing. You still own the book and the TV. So you could still you could trade that TV with somebody else for its value with for their currency, for their personal credit. Now the community, the community credit not only flows to your local community, the region, and the world, but it also – here's the best part. This, I think this is fun, personally. We also give each individual a UBI of community credit every month. So you can't personally use this community credit to buy your TV for yourself. Okay, You can only use it to either give to another enterprise or to use in your yoga studio. Right. So if you wanted to be a yoga dude and you wanted to, you know, I don't know, maybe buy a TV for the yoga studio, right? You can use your community credit to buy that TV. Now, when you do so, though, by the way, Jim, when you're using that community credit to buy the TV for that yoga for the Two Fools Yoga Studio, the TV is uh, is a piece of property now that is owned by the Two Fools. But guess what? Who owns the Two Fools? The community does. Yeah, I, I did follow that. And that was, I thought, quite clever. And I call that whole classification, that whole style, color of money. That one of the beautiful things about computer-based money is that money can have color. One of the examples in my system, I talk about political money, for instance, that every citizen gets $10 a month. And the only thing that money can be used for is to be given to a registered political organization for either lobbying or a candidate. And oh, by the way, those entities may only take that color, money of that color, so that 
the welfare mothers equal to you know the uh, the Koch brothers in terms of their their impact because there is some benefits to money in politics, but it, only if everybody has the same amount, right? And it, what's what sucks is that in our current system, you know, the big fish, you know, have way bigger voices in the money in politics game than the little fish. So uh, I call that the color of money, and I like to see that in a system because it takes advantage of what we could do. Kind of moving along here in time, but that's, we covered the most important part. Let's get to another part, though, that I think is very good about your system. I have to think about it some more, but I think it's really generative. And that is, how does one start a business? And what do you not have to pay for that people traditionally pay for in their businesses, i.e. Make it, making it easier to start? Well, uh, so you won't have to pay for, generally speaking, not of, if it exists, you won't have to pay for office space, factories or warehouses or, or any of those things for your enterprise. Or, you know, because in most cases, well, obviously, for the things that already exist, there's no reason to have to pay for them, right? They already exist. Uh, machines, if you're already an existing factory, so to speak, you already exist. You already bought the stuff, so to speak. So you obviously don't have to pay for those things. However, because there isn't accounting and prices of all the stuff that's moving around, that's why you're using the community credit. And so the community credit is going to determine, you know, your profit is basically just is the community credit, right? So the more your enterprise profits, the more you get to keep that, that, that currency. And so the more currency you have, the more physical stuff you can buy. But you won't need to buy your office, pay rent for your office, for example, because it already exists. Who owns it? The community. Well, the community doesn't need your money because they're already getting money through the uh, community credit as a UBI. And so the money's flowing to them. They don't have to have taxes. They don't have to rent the, the building right anymore. No one owns the building. The community owns the building. Assume that the community already allocated their community credit to build the building. Now, if you don't have enough buildings or a factory or warehouses or whatever, trains, then your community will use simply use its existing community credit. And remember, individuals also are getting this community credit too. So not only are, is the community have their own pile, but so do people. So people can flow their community credit wherever they want in the world. They're not restricted to only giving it to their local town. They can give it to their town, their region, or some other town somewhere else in the world, or even the globe. It doesn't matter. It's theirs. They can do whatever the hell they want with it. And because they can't spend it personally, the individual, as I mentioned in the book, we can allow that currency to transfer from person to person. So we can still have these stupid games of betting and, and gambling and all this other bullshit that we have because it won't destroy a, a person fundamentally, their ability to participate in the world and, and the market because it's not their personal credit that they're giving away. It's the community credit. And so who cares who has it and how it flows? If, you're, if you want to be irresponsible and bet and gamble your community credit, so what? It doesn't hurt the community. The community is still going to get that credit somewhere. You know, it's just that you didn't get to decide where it goes. Somebody else did. Anyway, nevertheless, so the enterprise won't have to pay for rent. They might not have to pay for energy costs if it's sufficient, if there's no cost to it. In some cases, there will be. But they will have to pay for anything physical that they need, all their inputs, right? If, if you're a factory and you're making bread or whatever, you got to pay for the wheat and all the grain and whatever you're, you need. So there's a cost there and you're using your community credit. You have an account. And so you're paying for all that, but there's also a price that you're selling. And so we can determine the profit mechanism. Now, some enterprises are not the same. Just because a particular enterprise that's making bread, let's say their accounting doesn't show a profit because bread seems to be easy to make and plentiful and, and it's cheap, and it doesn't seem to be producing a profit, so to speak, for the enterprise, All none of the bread makers are profitable, right? Well, then we just reduce the, the baseline where the baseline number is, so to speak, and to, to determine the bonus, the actual, you know, profit, that makes any sense. Like, it's okay if you're on a, an accounting basis, if your enterprise is, is supposedly losing money, because we're not playing the game in a circulatory regime. So it doesn't matter if you're profitable from that perspective. The only thing that matters is whether you're profitable in the sense that the community needs or wants what you're actually producing. And so ultimately, the accounting is going to reflect that. But in terms of your costs, your only costs really are your inputs. And the key thing, when you didn't explicitly mention, I don't think, is you don't pay for your people, right? And again, in most businesses, your payroll is your biggest business expense. No, hold on. No, no. Okay, so yes, you, you're not paying for your people, though. But you, earlier you mentioned this, is, and you alluded to this, and this is the genius of this, by the way, this system, I think. I didn't design it. I mean, this was all by accident, kind of like, you know, step by step. And what if we did this? Anyway, so these are thought experiments. These are questions that I asked myself that led to this. But now that I see it, of course, what it does, though, Jim, is that, 
Okay, so even though you as the enterprise don't have to use your credits to pay for these people, the cost of the labor that you are that you are paying these people is a part of your profit of the bonus. Yeah, virtual P&L, yeah. So I, think, I figured that out. I figured okay, that good, out. Good. So, yeah. so there is still a, an opportunity for some business to say, look, we need, we're more profitable. I can pay people more. And so they, there is an opportunity for them to increase the proof of value for those labor to, to make sure that they are able to attract and incentivize the labor that needs to get done, basically. So there is a P&L function there, but you're right. From a personal perspective, the people who began the enterprise, none of their personal credit is going to be going to pay for the labor, period, ever, which is beautiful. So they don't risk their own personal well-being. Yeah. And of course, you'll end up with more bad businesses this way, but that's all right. That's Possibly. not the end of the world. Possibly. As long as you have ways to kill them quickly. So I would, you know, I would say, you know, spend some time thinking about the kill switches and you know, the system will produce people who want to do X, but that's okay. And again, it's, it's way, think of all the waste we're getting rid of, right? We're getting, we're getting rid of all the bankers, all the fucking real estate goddamn brokers. You know? How many kinds of useless parasites will we be getting rid of? We can afford to take on a little bit of inefficiency elsewhere. Exactly. Okay, very cool. There's lots of decisions that have to be made here you know, from the example of, oh, there's only one office left and two people want to own open yoga studios, how do we decide, you know, or we got a bundle of, of regional credit, how much do we want to put into schools versus police versus yeah. uh, picking up the trash, right? So there's always decisions. And you have a little section on, you know, how to decide, you know, and you call it democracy. Uh, I would just point out that I'm not 100% sure that we should be so anchored on democracy. You know, I had a very interesting podcast with Forrest Landry recently. And one of the things we talked about is the negatives of democracy, in particular, because it, by definition, divides people. Right? Either if everything, if someone comes to a vote, no matter what, no matter how you chose to vote, there's people who won and there's people who lost, and that builds animosity. And, and there's a game theoretic thing that goes on, which is each side tries to build coalitions, and we end up with the shit show we got. What he proposes is kind of this very interesting, odd thing, which is a mixture of consensus, dictatorship, and democracy, where every job or, you know, every, he calls them executive, is created by consensus and only by consensus. So Ramsey's appointed dictator of the farm, right? And you have absolute power to run the farm until a democracy dispowers you. The only thing that democracy can do, 51% of the people in the village say, Ramsey, your fucking tomatoes suck. You're fired. And then it, you're fired. And then it goes back to consensus and consensus chooses the new executive. So there's an example of a non-democracy, seemingly reasonable operating system. But nonetheless, you know, let's use the word uh, democracy. And you list some of the interesting ones, disparate democracy, deliberative democracy, direct democracy, which can work just fine in small communities. And my favorite, liquid democracy. So uh, maybe give a little bit of thought to how are decisions made? Okay, so the, again, generally the idea here is to allow decisions to be made from the uh, individual on up. And so the more that a decision impacts you, the more say you should have. And that's the kind of democracy that I'm imagining. Now, if a decision doesn't involve you, let's say, for example, obviously what to do with the money of a town which in which you don't live in, well, you don't have a say, obviously. They're not going to give you a say. But the, the neat thing about this formulation of currency, this flow currency, the w- reason why it doesn't have the same problems of democracy that we have in game A is because ultimately we are still allowing individuals and their compatriots to, you know, and the local community, like you mentioned, who are going to decide what to produce and what and how to produce. But once the individuals decide, certain locations you know, may say, look, you know what? We're going to allow enterprises to do whatever they want. They can be dictatorial, they can be hierarchical, or they can be distributive. They can it, so so the local community kind of can make their own rules, so to speak, on these things. And that's the beautiful thing here is because we need experimentation. We want people and the communities to experiment with different ways of making decisions, right? Because we're not just using the currency to allocate resources, but decisions like you just mentioned of, of even who should be making and or where, et cetera. These are not easy decisions. They involve a lot of people. But generally speaking, by allowing the locals, you know, and on up to make the decisions for themselves without, there's no regional authorities that are going to come in and saying, you guys, you can't just let all your enterprises be hierarchical and dictatorial just because that guy, he's the one who founded it. He wants to make all the decisions, hire and fire people. You can't let him do that. Well, yes, you can. 
you know, because you're the local community. They can't tell you what to do. You can operate. I love that. You're, and if you don't like it, here's a beautiful thing about that method, though, Jim, is that if the people of that local community are really that dissatisfied with the way that things are running, they, remember, through the democracy, you either change it or you fucking move. Exactly. Vote with your feet if necessary, right? Yeah. So that yeah, I love it. That's that's the right answer because one of the things I'm upcoming more and more convinced is that we're talking about a high dimensional design space here and doing exploration in the design space is hugely important. And anybody comes in with an answer and says, this is the answer, motherfucker, uh, you're almost certainly wrong. So anyway, I think we're going to wrap it up here. This has been a, a good conversation. You want to say one more thing? Yeah. So the difference between this democracy that I'm talking about and what we have today is that in this one, you're not trapped. It's a it's a system that allows for experimentation and change and freedom that you don't have in modern society. In modern society, you're a citizen of a particular state. You're trapped. Now, the only opportunity you have is to change the way the decisions and the democratic process is done within your country. But that's it. You can't leave. It's not very easy to leave. You're not allowed to go someplace else. And so you're essentially trapped. Whereas in this system, it's a, it's a massive freedom for the individuals and for the community because there is no trapping of the community. It's easy for people to go, come and go because you're not married to any particular location. You're not, you're not a citizen of the – you are a citizen of the community by choice, not by force. And that's the difference. That's a good thing. Thank you, Ramsey. This has been great. I will tell you, I get these kind of new monetary schemes thrown over my transom from time to time, and most of them I can blow out of the water in about 10 minutes. This one, I uh, want to think about a little bit. There's definitely some important ideas here. I would encourage people who want to learn more, get the book, Common Planet at common-planet.org. This is actually time well spent reading this book. I enjoyed it. And I thank you for your very important contribution to this field. I appreciate that very much, Jim. Thank you. That was very nice. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.